Hi, my name's Phil, I like talking about politics and in this video it'll come as no surprise that I'd like to talk about the by-election results for Rutherglen and Hamilton West as Labour won with a swing larger than people really thought they were going to. I'll be talking about what this means for Labour but also adding my thoughts onto what the SNP are saying about the result as well. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So, as I always say about by-elections, it's, well, it's what, by-election day again. We've got another one in two weeks' time. We're getting quite a few of them. But you can get into a mess looking at results and swings for a by-election and reading too much into them regarding the general election. In a general election, most people are voting for, like, their choice of government, sometimes their choice of prime ministers. Many don't vote for a choice of government, but against a particular choice for government. But a by-election, especially one so close to the actual general election, can be a protest vote as much as anything else. It, it won't change the balance of power in Westminster. So voters can use their vote for whatever they like. You know, the SNP strategy was to harness the vote as a protest against some of Labour's less popular policies in Scotland. But I'll talk more about the SNP strategy in a bit. But the, the thing, the other thing to point out is that by-elections don't get nearly as many people voting at general elections. And the people who stay at home don't have the same attitude to elections as the people who turn up for a by-election. The people who turn up for a by-election are the ones who just want to engage with democracy for whatever reason. The ones who stay at home but will go to the general election, they are the ones who want to determine who the government's going to be. You know, the turnout for this seat in the general election was 66.5%. Now, that was slightly below average for the UK, even more below average for Scotland, which posted the highest turnout figures in 2019. The turnout in this by-election was 37.2. Now, that is also a little bit below the average turnout for by-elections in recent times, but then it doesn't have the spice of having the chance to kick a Tory out, I suppose. But it's still within the bounds of what you'd expect for a by-election. The, the point is... There's loads of voters who will vote at the general election who didn't do so yesterday. So, you know, don't read too much into it. That being said, literally everyone in the country that's not me is reading everything into these results from what will happen in the general election to what we should have for tea tomorrow. And uh, there's a projection of these results that shows the SNP winning fewer seats than the Tories at the general election. So, you know, that's going to be in the media. But anyway... Let's go with it. First of all, Labour had to win this seat. Of Labour's target seats in Scotland, this is amongst the most straightforward to win back. If the SNP had retained this seat, it would have been a disaster for Starmer. There would have been a very sour mood at the party conference this week. A lot of questions would be asked. However, not only did Labour win it, but they absolutely beasted it. That conference mood will now be carnival because it's not just that they won, they won better than people were expecting or even hoping for, really. The evidence is there that Labour can win a solid majority at the general election. All of that tosh about hung parliaments can now be consigned to the, the, the rubbish bin. You know, it's all nonsense. Like There have been people talking, oh, if Labour don't do this, they're not going to win the election. If Labour do... And they're constantly attacking what Labour are doing despite the fact that Labour have this large lead in the polls. Even yesterday in The Guardian, people going, oh, Labour need to do this or they won't win the election. It's like, really? Have you seen the results today? Really? You know, but, but what does the size of the swing suggest? Now, first of all, you know, anyone will sort of tell you, 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 you can't really project Labour gains in Scotland in a general election based on this swing in a by-election. Hasn't stopped everyone doing it anyway. Some for paid commissions, just some for fun but it's not entirely valid. Like, Labour would not have gained this swing in the general election. See, for this by-election, Labour could afford to throw the kitchen sink at it. They're fighting, like, one seat on one day, and then there's two more coming up in a couple of weeks. At the general election, they're going to have about 150 target seats with their eyes on dozens more. They cannot afford to put this amount of focus onto one seat, so projecting from this swing would flatter Labour. That be And it has done. That being said, accounting for that by-election focus, pollsters reckoned that, you know, Labour needed like a 15-point swing. 15-point swing. Some were talking pie in the sky, like proper blue sky thinking, oh, 20 points, I really, I really like they'd be sweeping Scotland up. Well, they got a 20-point swing. 
There was lots of talk. The focus was on the 15 points. Labour aiming for the 15 points. Can they get 15 points? It might only be a 10-point swing. You know, 10-point swing might show that Labour, yes, they can take seats like this, but they'll struggle with some of their more challenging target seats. 20-point swing. That is beyond any expectations. In fact, such were the swings towards Labour that only the SNP of the losing candidates retained their deposit. Yes, not only did the Tories lose their deposit, but I regret to inform you that Prince Ankit Love, Emperor of India, failed to get his deposit back as well. This means that all the talk will be of Labour doing better than expected as they gear up for their crucial conference. Anna Sawa seems quite pleased. He seems quite happy today for some reason. As for the SNP, now there were excuses from a number of representatives, uh, but a more thoughtful question from Stephen Flynn. Now, the main excuses centred around the previous MP, Margaret Ferrier, and Labour focusing on the by-election. Now, with Ferrier, yes, a badly misbehaving MP can reflect poorly on the party, so that can cause a problem when retaining a seat. That being said, the SNP did not attempt to cover for her. Because that sometimes happens. You know, when a misbehaving MP falls, they've had a bit of cover from their party to try and like, conceal it, to try and avoid the need for a by-election. There was none of that. You know, she immediately had the whip withdrawn. I don't think you can fault the way the SNP handled the situation. And I've seen no evidence that voters think that this reflects badly on the SNP. As for Labour pumping in lots of resources for the by-election, well, OK, yes, but... There are spending limits in elections. I've seen a lot of mad um, claims about what Labour are pumping into it. There are spending limits. There are laws on what you can do, including by-elections. Also, it's not like the SNP had other things to do. Like if the SNP are going to say that Labour threw in massive resources for the seat, it's like, well, well, why didn't the SNP then? If they're struggling for cash, they've got a spare motorhome they can sell. But Stephen Flynn, a bit more thoughtful, I thought, a bit more pragmatic, he said his party needed to ask themselves why so many SNP voters stayed at home. Now, the easy answer to that is they didn't. Yes, the turnout, as I said, was a little low for a by-election, but it wasn't noticeably so. Uh, and the turnout was slightly low in the general election for this seat anyway, so maybe it's just a low, slightly low turnout type of seat. But a better answer would be to look at what the SNP were offering voters. Think about what different parties offer voters. Labour and the, when it comes to Westminster election, Labour and the Conservatives offer government. Obviously, Labour and the Conservatives cannot offer that government in a by-election, but they're saying, show us your support so that we can build that momentum towards that government, you see, at the general election. That's their offer. Obviously, the SNP cannot do that in Westminster, but they have a, they can sort of allude to it. They can still say the same thing. It shows your support for us in the Scottish parliamentary elections where we are in government so they have a little bit of that the Lib Dems can't offer that so what do they offer well they offer better representation in parliament than their challenger well the SNP can also offer that and their strategy for this by-election was entirely centered on that it wasn't a talk so obviously I wasn't in Rutherglen and Hamilton West at any point but I looked online for as much literature as I could so I saw several uh, examples of SNP campaign literature. None of it was centred on their good work in government in Holyrood, which it could have been, even though this is a Westminster election, it's still a by-election. You can, People can still use it to support the SNP for their work in the Scottish government. They centred it entirely on um, Labour are the same as the Tories. That's what it all said. That was their entire pitch. Labour are the same as the Tories. So they were attacking some of Labour's policies, some of the ones that might not be that popular in Scotland, without really saying what alternative they were offering. You know, every single bit of literature I saw is like, oh, Labour are just the same as the Tories, without a single line about how the SNP were different. When it's like, well, Labour aren't the same as the Tories. I know the Tories try and push that a lot. And anyone who wants to stop Labour winning pushes it, but it's not actually true. And the argument failed because it's evidently not true. But the SNP also have another offer to voters as well. The drive for independence for those voters who want it. But this was completely lacking in the by-election. Not that they didn't mention independence, but they didn't say what, they were, what their policy was. And that's because the SNP do not have a policy. They have a policy in favour of it, but not a plan. They did have under Sturgeon and now that's, we don't know what it is now. Consider that the SNP chose the timing of this by-election. 
they could have chosen to hold it after their own conference. You know, the Tories chose their by-elections to be on the 19th of October. SNP could have done the same. Where, where they would have been fighting one by-election, Labour would have had three on the same day. That would have benefited the SNP. They could have done that, where Yusuf will be expected to outline his plans for the independence campaign. The fact that they held the by-election before their conference rather than afterwards suggested one of two things. Either they had a plan to win it, and, and that would have been a really powerful message, or that Yusuf doesn't plan to announce anything which will fire up the base at the conference. Now, the SNP must have had internal polling of voting intention for this seat before they decided the date for the by-election. They must have had something to base it on. They must have known they were on for a hiding. I said previously, it was a very bold move to hold it just before Labour's conference. The prize of pissing on Starmer's bonfire would have been enticing. But by losing, and by losing by this margin, it's now given Starmer a boost. Labour got double the number of votes the SNP did. That's a huge boost. If the SNP did not look like winning, and they must not have done, they should have held it right after their conference, after making lots of popular announcements to fire up the base and get them to turn out in the by-election. Are we to suppose that Yusuf didn't think he's going to be able to fire supporters up? Is that why he held the by-election yesterday, despite the likelihood of just giving Labour a boost? Looking at the results, I cannot understand why the SNP did this. That is the question the SNP should be asking themselves. Why did they pick this date when they didn't have a strategy to win? And if they think they did have a strategy to win, given how badly they lost, like this was a, a defeat by a margin beyond expectations, what can the party, when can the party strategists basically expect their P45s? Because you cannot allow your strategist to be this bad. You know, Stephen Flynn's right to question his party's leadership here. For all the excuses coming out, which is standard political procedure, they need to ask questions of themselves. Like, ex if you make excuses publicly, but privately you're saying, right, we need to take ownership of this, we need to take responsibility, that's fine. You, you build on that, you improve. But if they're consoling themselves with excuses privately as well, if they're using the excuses on themselves, then they're in trouble. Now, Flynn's concern won't be for himself, his own seat's safe enough, but he's now looking at losing maybe 20 colleagues at the election. Although if you look at these projections, it'd be way more than that. But again, I, I, like I said, I don't think you can do that. You know, I think the SNP, you know, would still be expected to win more seats than Labour. But all it takes is for momentum to swing in Labour's favour. And that has started today. And for the Labour government in Westminster to start improving people's lives in a noticeable way in Scotland. Then the Holyrood elections in 2026 become very interesting. Labour will probably have two years as Westminster government to deliver something tangible. And if they do, Sawar at the moment thinks he might be first minister after the next election. Hmm. Yusuf has now got a very big conference coming up. He needs to give a stunning speech. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.